Hi, this is Paul. Wanted to do a video on why is everything becoming unglued? People are becoming unglued. Now, obviously, the answers, the protests, too much social media, too much news, uh, too much virtual drama. But I wanted to have a little bit of an overview video and talk about this. I haven't put out a lot of monologue videos recently. I've been busy with my day job. And I've been... Um, usually when I have a hard time... I wanted to put out a video yesterday afternoon and I actually recorded some and threw it away. It's because I've got too many things going on in my head and I can't sort them out into even something coherent for me, which isn't always that terribly coherent to scatter shot and unfocused but in conversations with regular people um, regular people meaning people in my church people in my community people that I talk to as individuals on the channel there is a high degree of stress right now there's a high degree of anxiety and when this kind of stuff happens people naturally want to take action to resolve it the difficulty is that there's not necessarily relationship between the action they take and a better future some people are taking action with drinking or doing more pot or watching more netflix some people are taking action by going out into the street with signs and yelling some people are taking action taking it out on their spouses or their dogs some people are taking action drowning it in their work uh, this is a meaning crisis and some and so i wanted to go through some of what i've learned over the last couple of years and maybe give you a few things that might help rebel wisdom is doing a lot of things on sense making and when they first started talking about sense making i didn't connect with the term very well of course i heard the term from eric weinstein and his idw stuff and so you know i had a sense of the term one of the things that i'm you know really paying attention to is how i usually use the word fudgy but also how sloshy words are we we use these words when we've got a grip on 30 percent of it and the rest is sort of spilling all over the place when we use the words so what what is the sense making that rebel wisdom says we need so badly and now i listen to and watch a lot of their videos and i enjoy them and i i very much appreciate and benefit from the work that they're doing but the sense making thing didn't didn't really connect with me what 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 do you mean by this sense making now i want to go through a little bit of stuff and this is a lot of my stuff and some stuff i've learned from verveke and peterson and stuff i thought about beforehand our earliest sense making activity is story and early on benjamin boyce had a really good conversation with john verveke about story and us and as i've mentioned in previous videos before any of this happened and I was wrestling with the question of what is Christianity and and we have these stories in this book and you have Jesus resurrection and I remember people saying to me things like okay conservative Protestant what if Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago so what what does that have to do with my life and it forced me to think a lot about what Christianity is and the Christian story and how that fits together and before all of this I came to the conclusion that and you've heard me say it many times, people are, see, and again, language gets difficult. People are stories. Now, now they're not just stories, but, you know, in a sense, you know, they're going to pick hard to find, uh, they got to pick hard. Well, okay. Uh, this is, this is historical. This is history. Um, is the story in the book? No, the story's not in the book. Where is the story? Uh, the book is, representing the story the book is conveying the story but the story is in the book and what is the story and and what was martin luther king jr I, I thought about this when i was thinking about the resurrection because i was thinking okay well let's say you know poop poop that's not the right word uh, pop i'm in the right i'm in a i mean i'm in a new body but what am i and 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 i'm the story and i thought about the fact that well 
the story I tell about myself, well, there's multiple aspects to it. And sometimes when I'm with different people, I tell and I see myself in different light. The, my wife sees me differently than I see myself. My kids see me differently than my wife sees me and I see myself. My congregation sees me differently. And, and I thought this through and I said, basically, what you need is God. Only, only, I think God's not a thing. Only God can see all of me. Because part of me is the story that goes from Stan and Barb and back through history into my ancestors. And there's genetics at work and there's culture at work. And, and, and the, the thing that is myself as an individual, if I can be conceived that way, because to what degree am I not my father or my grandfather or not and on and on. I'm this, I'm this story, but I'm, I'm, I'm a story that's, and again, the, the cognitive science, I'm a story that's embodied and, and I'm... I'm embodied to a far higher degree than this. The story of Dr. King and bearing the cross is embodied in this book. So, so I'm a story. And now, now John Verveke pointed out, and has pointed out to me a couple of times, and it's, he's exactly right, that this, 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 this story capacity, this psychotechnology, as he would say, that we have isn't, well, it's it's it, we come up into it. Our memory making capacity seems connected to our story making capacity, and in fact, we store many memories in this narrative. So there's a a a marriage and family um, a psychologist in my church that does a lot of EMDR with the the lights and 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 so if you read the body keeps the score, you read about how traumatic memories are not integrated properly into the story somehow and that causes problems and so looking at these flashing lights and talking about the story somehow rewires the mind and so the, the story that is me is is somehow built into this body the story that is me and my food preferences and my and my habits and everything gets built into this body and and it gets expressed in this office and so it's it's me but it's not just me and it's connected and it's this it's this astounding thing what a human being is but it's but but we can't understand it and in a sense our native language for all of this is story so, so consciousness obviously affords live experiences. My dog has consciousness, but to the best of our knowledge, my, my dog, even though my dog clearly has memory, my, my dog does not have the same kind of story capacity that I have. Now, now one, of the, one of the amazing capacities of story is future. And, and you might say that, that story affords us past and future. And, and, and in this way, story sort of affords us future, future sight because if we look on our past as story, we can kind of turn around and look to our future as story. And so this story capacity is very important and very integral to who we are. And, you know, as Jordan Peterson noted with the lobsters and our and our systems and again this is a layman's guide i don't know this stuff i'm not a psychologist i'm not a cognitive scientist i'm just listening to these people and these these people like john verbeke and jordan peterson and and jonathan height they're telling me things that 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 i can never hope to know to the level that they know but they obviously think it's important that i grasp it at some point and somehow it'll improve my life okay and and i take them at their word and i take them as uh, as trustworthy and reliable people who are who are not being who are not telling me a tale or lying to me and and we are all practicing this in in good faith one to another and we're trying to figure out this wild mystery we call a life and so we use models like like story and like all our scientific models to try and integrate this into a cohesive whole for the sake of what? And even then we're not clear on for goodness or health or beauty or truth or something moving forward. And so this is this is what we're we're piecing together and putting together. Now, our narratives likely start quite small and probably quite disconnected, but the older we go and the more we live and the more we learn and the more we develop, they become more cohesive, but they're also deeply formed by our childhood, quite obviously. And so here's a picture of, 
of Northside Chapel in Patterson, New Jersey that I used in my my video about race. And and so, you know, I've got not only have do I have Stan and me in terms of my DNA, but I've got Stan and me in terms of watching him. And I've got my mother and me in terms of my DNA and my mother and me in terms of watching and molding and shaping and forming and all of that. And and you know, consciousness affords we have these emotional realities and experiential data and we're constantly taking this in and it's by no means all passing through the 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 consciousness layer we're just taking it in massively all the time and 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 at levels where we're by no means conscious of and that is forming and developing developing us into these amazing wonderfully wonderful powerful things that we call human beings but, but along with this come all of the biases that we have because we need the biases because the world is too big. And so we translate things down into, as Jordan Peterson said to Roger Scruton, these little cartoons and, and we hold them. And if you look at my conversation with, I can't remember his name right off the bat, the musician from upstate New York, from Albany, please forgive me for, for not coming up with your name this quick. But he said, you know, I work with these musicians and they carry around these snapshots and, 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 and they're living out of these snapshots. And this connected me very much with the MDR conversation about, yeah, these traumatic snapshots. And we, we live out of them. And, you know, once bit, twice shy. And, and all of these things that we're doing. And so this is, a, this is an astounding process that we're living through and working through and molding us and forming us. And then, and then uh, Barbara, and I think, can't think of her name, Erin, she wrote Nickeled and Dimed, and she wrote, um, it wasn't a wild and crazy God. Uh, you guys will clean it up in the comment section. Um, Barbara Ehrenreich um, wrote this fascinating book about her her mystical experiences that she has, and she's a, you know, she's a, she's a stone-cold atheist. And, and it's a book about God, and she doesn't believe in God. And this reminds me of Chesterton's quote about mysticism, that, you know, lay people both, both you know, believe in God and doubt God and, and, and all of this crazy thing that it, that it means to be it. But, but anyway, sh what did she talk about in that book? She talked about, oh, yeah, it's the, um, you know, it's not the people, you know, <laughs> people, when people are talking to me, they're talking to their parents and they're talking to their siblings and they're talking to their enemies, and they're talking to their friends. In other words, we're all these little low-resolution pictures with each other. And I was going to comment on, a, on some of the negative comments that I get on YouTube, and I don't, get, I don't get very many of them, which I'm not sure is always good. But, but whenever you get a comment like that, it's very clear that the story they have of me is not the story I have about myself. And, and often in this social media world, the story they imagine me to, me to be is based on just one or two data points. And, and, and I have to apologize to the world because I do this to all of you too. The, the first time there's an impression of you, there's this data download that's coming in and, and it's being checked against all of my past situations and 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 interactions and relationships and all of that and if if you like me had a stable household and wonderful generous faithful parents and surrounded by a loving and and robust community of of care and concern and well-being not perfect but but if you grew up with many of the blessings I grew up with, it now suddenly I have an affordance of trust and an affordance of transparency because I see people who grew up with quite a bit less than that and they're skittish and they're defensive and they're, they're suspicious and all of those things got built in very early. And of course, there's, there's genetics in there and, and there's wiring, as Jonathan Haidt talks about in the happiness hypothesis and all of this. And we're all of these things, each one of us individually. And we come into this world and this, and this amazing interaction doesn't stop. But of course, the foundational childhood ones are, are critical. And, and, and often they can be surmounted and, and gotten past. But, but many, many people don't get past them. And then eventually identities form. And... As our stories grow, we have to take on certain roles, the role of a son, the role of a worker, the role of a student, the role of a Christian uh, when confronted with non-Christians, the role of this, the role of that, the role of this, and identities form. 
okay? And identities form from from some incidental things or seemingly incidental from the from the amount of pigment in my skin, by the amount of height that I received from my father, by whether or not my eyes work well enough to to that I don't need glasses by the the accent that I have being from New Jersey there's not much of one um, because my parents were from different places and again the 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 astounding complexity and myriad of things that come in and and then we have all these identities that we don't even know we have so as our stories grow we become more aware that we are players in these stories in relationship with others and there are aspects to our characters we become increasingly aware of. And, and agency grows as we become story shapers. We, we very soon begin to know that we can shape our identities and we can take on identities that we didn't have before. And if our story is going in a way that we don't prefer, maybe we can move our story in another way. And this starts from a very young age, from when we learn the word no. And when we hear and see that our parents are responsive to our cries or unresponsive to our cries. And so we find other ways. And so we're, we, we find our agency. And so we're these story shapers. And, and so we're not only stories, which to us feel sort of passive, but, but the stories themselves take on agency. And so we're, these, we're just these amazing, amazing creatures. And, and, then, and then our stories become tools and we learn how to lie and we learn what the truth is and we learn to, to say the truth in a particular way that gets an outcome and we learn to take on an identity that gets an outcome that we like. And remember from my racism videos, we, we see meaning before we see the other resolutions. We see opportunities and obstacles. And, and so we're, we're constantly doing this and we're doing this in ways that we have no idea that we know that we're doing it. And our stories get increasingly communal. We begin to see aspects and groups and institutions as agents and characters. And we talk that way incessantly and, 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 and listen to the agency. And so we're, 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 suddenly we're part of tribes. And, and my identity and my tribe start to coalesce. And we realize that, that we have duties and responsibilities and opportunities within tribes. And so now suddenly we're, we're defensive because we're defending our tribe or we're aggressive because we're taking on new territory. And, and we cooperate with others in our tribe in order to compete. And our tribes are elastic and they move around. And sometimes I'm part of this tribe and sometimes I'm part of that tribe, often depending on where I'm standing and who I'm standing with and who I'm talking to and, and whether I see the situation as, as an opportunity or an obstacle. And so communally, all of this stuff is being built in. And again, we're doing all of this stuff and we don't even know it. We practice it when we're playing sports teams or when we're playing board games or when we're, we figure out that we're the teacher's pet or, or the teacher hates us or we're the smart kids in class or we're the dumb kids in class or we're the obedient, compliant kids in class or we're the, the rebellious kids in class and on and on and on and on and on and on these things go. And then we get these ideas of just listen to healthy and not healthy. And so we stick with our tribes until something changes. It might be a plausibility structure. It might be a traumatic event. It might be a new narrative opportunity for us to take on a new identity because we think that there'll be more opportunity with this new identity. Or maybe we took on a new identity and then we're being shaped and shaped and shaped by a new community and a new context and new books we're reading and new movies we're watching. And so suddenly we discover I'm a different person than I was five years ago. I didn't try to be, but now suddenly I am. And now even some of the longest, deepest elements of our identity get shaped and there's a transformation. And the transformation can be pleasant and exhilarating or it can be painful and laborious. And, and these narratives we soon discover seem to have lives of their own. And, and we're always evaluating them. Is this healthy? Is this not healthy? Is this good? Is this not good? And we're using the narratives to evaluate it. Yeah, you know, Homer drinking the mayonnaise and the vodka, and Marge says, Homer, that's not a good idea. That's for tomorrow's Homer. Well, if Homer knows narrative, yeah, he'll be tomorrow's Homer tomorrow. And these narratives are interconnected at levels of um, at levels and with technologies human beings haven't seen now. And no wonder people are feeling unglued. You know, we, we look at a statue and say, it's just a statue. No, it's not just a statue. 
Well, we look at the statue and say, well, if you know anything about Andrew Jackson, well, he was pivotal in the War of 1812, beating the British. He also had uh, was pivotal in some in some pretty brutal um, interchanges with with those brought over from Africa and those who were already in the Americas when the Europeans came. Just, you know, there's plenty of literature out there written about Andrew Jackson, colorful character. Why do we esteem him? Well, we esteemed him because he helped our tribe win against a far... England was a world power and the United States was woefully unprepared and lost a war to Canada. I mean, think about that. Well, Canada wasn't Canada, but, you know, look at the celebrations of the War of 1812 in Canada compared to the United States. And even after the, the peace was made, but the news didn't get there, so the Battle of New Orleans, you know, Old Hickory came through and helped our tribe win. Now, to what degree do we participate in that narrative? And so if, as has been going on now, you reconstruct the narrative to have different values and different elements and you locate that narrative in a different place, well, Andrew Jackson looks different. And the statue on the Washington Mall, just in, not very far from the White House, well, there you have it. And so, ropes tied to this statue Depending on where you are in the narrative, how you've been formed, yeah, this is unsettling. Why was it when the U.S. invaded Iraq that all the statues got knocked down and people took their shoe and pounded it on Saddam's statue? Symbolism happens. I mean, the symbolism that Jonathan Peugeot talks about, this isn't, this isn't just happenstance. This is stuff built deeply into it. How do you feel when you see a flag burned? Do you say, yeah, let it burn? Depends on which flag, right? Depends on how you feel about your tribe, right? One year you might feel one way, another year you might feel another. Depends on the transformation you've been through. So sense-making is really narrative work. What's going on? How can I predict the future and show some agency in my own narrative to, to hopefully get myself in a position to receive a future that I want when the world is such chaos, when the economy is uncertain and COVID is still around and, well, I thought we were talking about police brutality, but now we're pulling down statues. What's going on? And is the government going to stop them? Sometimes the government seems to just stand there. And I think about I think about the fall of the Soviet Union. A lot of governments a lot of countries transform because they get to the point of saying what we got just isn't worth it. Let it burn. Well, this is what we're facing. We don't know what's coming down the road. Brett Weinstein, in his conversation with John McWhorter, says, you know, I'm seriously worried. John McWhorter's like, well, it all depends on the level of the fever, it seems, between the two of them. John McWhorter, well, this is going to heat up, and people are going to start making more sense, and it'll cool down again, and things will get back to normal. Brett Weinstein isn't so sure. I don't know. I don't know. And then I see the video of the woman who purportedly gave this guy the finger and followed him or something. And so he followed her back to her apartment and put the video camera on her while she freaked the heck out. And I remember the video of the, the college professor trying to talk reasonably to the other students at Yale. This wasn't this wasn't evergreen which this is Yale these are this college you know was looking to get the cream of the crop of the various crops and have them there and and when I when I watch this woman and when I listen to those students I hear pain in their voice now it's it's easy and it's dismissive to call them snowflakes but as a pastor part of me knows even, I'm going to get in trouble with this word, not well justified,
pain is still pain. So what do the people need? And, and most people, we don't want to feel pain. Some people do dramatize things because it gets them attention and you know there's a lot of we 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 have lots of stupid human tricks that we play in each other for all kinds of manipulative reasons but on one hand i might not find be in agreement with the stories that these individuals are telling themselves and the existential threats they feel but i've as a pastor been with plenty of people who freak out over things that i look at and say you're okay but yet their emotional response is real. And so how, generally speaking, do you help such people? Slap them across the face? Well, I haven't done that. There have been times when I've been very direct if I've had an opportunity and I thought that a very direct, loud approach would snap them out of it. Most of the time it's a lot of listening, taking a step back, sensitively asking questions, probing a little bit, because to change someone's perspective is to change their story. And, and again, this isn't, just, this isn't just like the nature of this story in the book. This is deeply built into us. And so, you know, we talk about pressing people's buttons. And if you know someone well, if you're married to someone, or if they're your kids, or if they're your parents, you know just what to say to trigger them emotionally. And there's a whole lot of people in this world that are covered with buttons and they're on hair triggers. And I'm afraid as a society, part of this amazing society that we've built with air conditioning and automobiles and, and delicious foods and entertainment and all of these things that we've built for us, is also a society that has really built people who are not hardy or solid, or non-reactive. People already have serious issues with reactivity. In that book, The Secret of Our Success, talked about, and other places too, talked about, you know, part of what sets us apart from chimpanzees is chimpanzees are enormously reactive. That's why they're also enormously strong. That's why they make terrible pets. Uh, my dog is... is, is more reactive than a human being but i can lend him some of my non-reactivity it seems and and settle the pooch down well we have sort of made and social media i think has a big part of this we have sort of made reactivity something that we reinforce and you know i'll have to take part of the blame for it my own videos they're in some ways reactive I've started making videos by reacting to Jordan Peterson's work. Now, now again, like many, many things, reacting isn't in itself a bad thing. Within measure, within context, in good faith, we react inside. We react outside. If our trigger, if we don't have a good handle on the trigger, we don't have good resistance to reactivity well we get ourselves in trouble and many of the people i work with who are homeless or substance abusers who struggle with what we call mental illness who have a variety of relational problems even successful people so much of it is as the book of james says can't control the tongue we react we talk first and think later. And this does a tremendous amount of damage. Jonathan Haidt in The Coddling of the American Mind. Narratives are communally created and maintained. And we've been molding expectations via movies and advertising and literature and news. And these are enormously powerful tools. And we spend hours and hours a day in front of them. And, and that's even before social media, which is far more addictive because, you know, ooh, the light gives me this little dopamine hit and, and on and on and on and on. And schools have been doing this intentionally and churches do this intentionally and, and, we're, and parents do this intentionally and governments do this intentionally. We all do this again and again and again, but the, 
the way in which we shape these things is vitally important. And of course, Jonathan Haidt talks about the fact that in a way we've set kids up. He talks about one side of it. I can't remember if he talked about the other side much, but I've seen the double side. On one hand, we, we teach children to always defer to a therapeutic authority who's going to make everything therapeutically well for them. And on the other hand, we listen to Steve Jobs and kind of this American rebellious, don't trust authority. And, and so it's tremendously ironic that, of course, I went to Christian school, and so the kind of commencement addresses we'd hear in Christian school would say things like, serve the Lord. The kind of commencement addresses you hear out of public education are, go out in the world and change it. Well... When I look at people in the street, I think they listen to the commencement address. Don't listen to authority. You know, travel your own path. But most people out there look a lot more like non-player characters out there. They're all traveling their own path all together in the herd. And, and, and so we gave them these two ideas. We told them, Submit to authority and comply. Schools give that idea very strongly. And then the other idea, don't listen to authority. Blaze a new trail. And it's like, well, there you go. And so now young people are in a double bind. They've been told, blaze your own trail. And don't listen to authority. And defer to authority. Well, which is it? And when you listen to the messages being given... You hear all the, co the collisions and inconsistencies of the conflict of those messages. The world people live in are a product of the stories and the images presented to them, as well as their personal experiences. I, I, for a long time, I thought about what does it mean that we watch these, these TV commercials and we see these billboards and, and, and we're just... We're just one product away from nirvana all the time. This is insane, the world we've created for human beings. And when you, you look at it in contrast to, let's say, a world 200 years ago that people lived in, when you were, a, you were a young person, you were very quickly given responsibility around the house or around the farm, and if you didn't hold up your end of the responsibility, the whole family would suffer, and they would enforce that too. And, and the dominant environment you lived in perhaps it was perhaps it was urban but just a small number of human beings lived in urban areas most people lived in rural areas and it was farming and so over the last couple of hundred years with urbanization we've radically changed human beings and what we eat and how we live and and we've we've molded and we've shaped this world and 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 so now this has just been changing dramatically with with the advent of electronic communication and mass media and then social media and 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 you know diversity is our highest goal well you keep flooding people they're, they're just trying to figure out what African Americans are like and now now they find Hispanics and they learn that well Hispanics are well they might be Mexican they might be Guatemalan they might be they might be from Spain they might be from Argentina and you're looking at vastly different cultures and now you're looking at Asians oh okay Asians and you and you recognize Chinese folks and Japanese culture and Korean culture and Vietnamese culture and Hmong culture well, they're all different and 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 you just keep bombarding people with all of these differences and yeah you know you go to the Thai restaurant and you enjoy the Thai food but that's a whole different thing from living in a Thai village or sleeping in a Thai home well the food is tasty but you know, even Chinese food. Almost nowhere you can go in the world and not find Chinese food. You talk to Chinese, a lot of Chinese people that I've talked about and said, yeah, that's not what we eat in China. Same with Mexican food. Same with Thai food. It's a product that they've labeled with their nation of origin so they have, in a sense, a marketing strategy. And there's nothing wrong with it. And living in a city like Sacramento where there's restaurants from all over the world is a delight. And it's, in a sense, Isaiah 60 and the kingdom of God because the treasures of the world have come to Sacramento and can be bought at an affordable price, even for a middle-class person who has a taste for different culinary diversity. 
But all that we've done has, has created a catastrophism in people. And we reward it. We reward people to we reward people to go out and say, I'm afraid to go in the street. Well, why? Because of a black man or a white man or an Asian man or an Asian woman. I'm afraid to be around white women because white women are going to make up a story about me and I'll be lynched. And now, if you were living in the Jim Crow South, it's a very real thing. And I'm not about to say that all of those wounds are healed and all of those triggers have gone away, but it is not like it was when Emmett Till was lynched. But it's different in every place. When I grew up in Patterson, the racism in Patterson was different from the racism in Grand Rapids, Michigan, was different from the racism in Santo Domingo, was different from the racism in Barahona, was different from the racism in Sacramento. People are like that. And, and, and we've created these narratives and and I'm afraid what we've done is, tr is created tremendously fragile people who are ready to react. And, and after COVID and everything, people and things are becoming unglued. And too often the way to keep people from keeping them from harming other people, well, the government's monopoly on the use of violence. I mention that sometimes to my children and they'll be like, what? Never heard of that. Well, why do police have guns? Well, arms of the government. They're supposed to have a monopoly on the use of violence, so we don't have to. And in some ways, this is a this is a statized version of vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Not you. Because when we're settling scores back with one another, there is no justice. And so sense-making is... We, we figure out what is racism. Um, we don't understand the abstracted term, but but it's all over the place. And it's the same. It's, it's very much in many ways the same types of things, particular histories, but same types of things. And we have these competitive definitions. We have propositional racism, and we have motivational racism, and we have consequential racism, and, and we keep flipping those between each other, and we see the consequences of racism, and we blame people for, and we say, you're motivated! Well, the system motivated? Systems certainly have motivations, but how is that like human motivations, and how isn't that like human motivations? What is real? And so, in the modern period, we say, reality is known by statistics. Well, please tell me what reality that is, because that's a picture from nowhere. And, and whereas it can be a powerful tool, when it, comes to person, when it comes to personhood, if you're the one struck by lightning or bit by a shark, or, or if you're the one that was the, was the victim of police brutality, well, it's not a statistics. It's real, and it's you. You don't care about statistics. Personal experience is not a statistic in terms of narrative shaping power. But it's real. And so, sense-making. This is what we're trying to do. Now, of course, Rebel Wisdom has lots of theories. And it's a YouTube channel. And so, it's not giving you personal experience. And, of course, Dave and Ali do men's work. And that's what they've done before. And, of course, those... That type of programming is more experiential, and so they get into the kinds of things that the channel gets into. But truth is, listening to a video might inform your gray matter to one degree or another, might help recalibrate some of the pictures, might do some of that, but there's physiology of reactivity that's very important. Because sometimes, by virtue of the things that were built into you, of course, remember... You see meaning first before this frontal lobe kicks in. And so you react and then suddenly, okay, back that reaction down. And so, you know, breathing techniques and count to 10 and, you know, all these kinds of ideas about oh, slow down, slow the anger down. Don't, don't just react. Don't just respond. Think. Take a day. Take a couple of days. Talk to a wise friend. Do all of these things. Filling our heads with more stuff, well, that has its place, but it's not all of it. How much does theory actually impact our sense-making? Now, I'm a pastor. 
and I talk to people for a living. Talk, 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 talk. Sermons, talk, 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 talk. Or Protestants do a lot of listening. People have to do their own talking, do a lot of listening. A lot of that talking, most of it bounces off. Most of it bounces off. It's repetition, it's personal, it's communal, it's habitual. It's a lot of the things that, a lot of the programming that's being done to us by movies or, or TV or sports or church. or I mean, these are all the things that have quite a bit more power. And of course, what gets in first sort of has priority in terms of a human being and can take a long time to unlearn some of those programs, as they're called. Of course, I wouldn't be a pastor if I didn't talk about Christianity. And I know we always hear about you know the the new atheist. The the new atheism died the minute I saw everybody having secular worship services in the street, woke worship services. It's like this this project of making people non-religious statistically didn't work, and it's not working now, and it's never going to work because of how we are wired. We see low resolution. We see through narratives. Narratives dominate. When someone, when someone says something that's not in alignment with a narrative I have, I immediately reject it. It takes a long time for that thing or a traumatic experience or an insight or something for, to change it. That's why we call it Killing someone, a blue pill or a red pill or, or, or a bread pill or a black pill or what have you because, well, we've gotten in used to taking pills in order to, to suddenly speed up the kinds of emotional things that, that usually take years to develop. So Bo Weingard on, on Twitter, I'm very open to the argument that Christianity is the best available totalizing narrative and that, its, and that its putative replacements have been a string of pseudo-secular religions with deleterious consequences. And Nathan Dickinson, Coder, Songs, Music, Grumpy, says, Do you think it's possible that Christianity, not the watered-down churchianity version, is best because it best comports with reality and human nature? Um, because there is a there there? Because it's actually true that Jesus was real and was God incarnate? There's a lot in that tweet. Bo responds, I think it's a view of human nature is largely correct, but I don't accept its metaphysics. And then, of course, Esther chimes in. <laughs> it's a powerful myth, but I don't accept its metaphysics. Uh, maybe you need to reconsider the total and totalizing narrative. Esther, 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 Esther. Oh, it's just something else. Postmodernity and narrative. So here we are. And, and postmodernity looked suspiciously at narratives, but of course, by virtue of the programming done to us when we were two or three, this powerful programming, we're not getting rid of narratives, boys and girls. You're just not being honest with them. Might as well be up front and say, to the best of my knowledge, because of course we don't see ourselves particularly well, this is my narrative. This is what I'm going to live with. And in the West... The Christian foundational narrative is so strong and pervasive. Rafe Kelly talked about my his father's bones, you know, riffing on Jordan Peterson. But here's the thing. There's been a ton of new data for the last 200, 500 years, and it's come so quickly that there hasn't been a that it hasn't been assimilated or resolved. And, and, and to figure that out, pastors and theologians and communities at work on this continually and, and I'm serious about all those three levels because all of these defections or deconstructions from Christianity are part of this process. And so this is part of the reason I keep repeating Ephesians 6.12 to Christians. We battle not against flesh and blood, which means that, okay, you're getting triggered by these people. Get your finger off the trigger and let's deal with the principalities and powers. And I've noticed in just about all of my question and answer videos, I'm getting the questions about angels and demons. And that was a question that, you know, I had with Jonathan Peugeot early on. And, 
you know, watches watches uh, symbolism happens videos, and you know, I my the last two and a half years have been sort of like Neo getting plugged into the back, and I've had to think harder and faster than probably many times in my life before that. Cognitive science, psychology, Jung, Nietzsche, um, Barfield. And of course, I've kept Lewis all along with me this whole time because I knew when I first saw Jordan Peterson and decided I would do a deep dive into him like I did into Tim Keller in the middle of the aughts, I didn't have video then, and I didn't do YouTube then, so you didn't hear about me. But if you search on my blog, you'll find a ton of Tim Keller stuff. And I listened to to dozens and dozens of his sermons and talks, and I took that in. And I knew when I started Jordan Peterson that I wanted, in a sense, a guide. I wanted sort of I wanted a guide to walk with me through this, and I wanted C.S. Lewis as that guide. Well, how can C.S. be that guide? He he died the year I was born. Well, he left something of himself in this, in his books. And so I keep reading other things and I keep reading Lewis and I go back and forth and, and I learn from Lewis and I learn how sometimes parts of Lewis are dated. And I've picked up new guides like Chesterton and he's been a helpful guide, but he's a little harder for me to understand than Lewis. And I found and I found personal friends and personal guides along the way, um, you know, to have the opportunity to talk with John Verveke and Rafe Kelly, but also Job and Jeff and and Sherry and Shelley and and Cassidy and 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 Luke can't forget Luke and and how many others on the Discord server and and on the Discord server to to create a community where there's there's Christians and non Christians and Sam the Sam always gets mentioned as the heretic. Well, you need a heretic around, so we got Sam, and um, I think I think we got a great heretic because Sam is really skillful at conversations, and his conversation with Brett Sockold was, I thought, a, a masterpiece, and and in the kind of dialogos, so some colonizing that John Verveke has done in me in terms of the kinds of conversations we need to have, and and so. All of that is my pro is my is my process in Christianity, and then you know when I was doing a lot more Jordan Peterson stuff, I'd get people that say, "Why are you talking about Jordan Peterson? Why aren't you talking about Jesus?" Well, go on the Church Channel. I talk about Jesus every week on the Church Channel. A lot fewer subs there, and some people say it's hard to find, but the link's always below in the notes. I always go. I always talk about Jesus on the Church Channel, but it's. I'm, I'm speaking within a tradition there, and I'm sort of freewheeling out here on my own channel, and a lot of people like the freewheeling, so that's why I have two channels. They're different elements of work, but this is the kind of stuff Christianity must do. And, and of course, it takes, it takes a church, it takes a massive village to do this because we need our hard line, hard our hardliners and our fundamentalists and our and our high and openness people and the people who've gone off the revel, reservation in the wrong way and on and on and on. Maybe that's a maybe that's a racist term now, going off the reservation. And and so my delight when I when I when I talk, talk to Rafe Kelly and I know a lot of Christian people listening to that would are like, why 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 are you why are you excited about this conversation well he's a great example that well christianity i'm not sure about this i'm not sure about that i'm not sure about revelation i'm not sure about any of this but agape boy that seems right and community that seems right so there's a lot going on there and and you know i asked myself how can steven pinker and brett weinstein again agree on modernity Modernity is going away, but agape is sticking with us. In some ways, the generation in the streets have, have never had it so good, and so Steven Pinker has a point. In other ways, Brett Weinstein has a point. Um, people are revolting until it costs them their cherished dreams, and, and this sort of keeps me going and catastrophizing along with Brett Weinstein sometimes, because... That's it's unfair to say what he does is catastrophizing, but he's, he's much more on the catastrophe side of things. But again, 
having lived what he lived and having experienced Evergreen as he did, and Benjamin Boyce too, I, I can understand why they have the positions they have. It's been built into them. And it's good that we can talk. And and for the most part, the, the commonality and agreement on agape is really important. And so I'm thankful for that. Difficulty is, though, however, when there's not a lot of agape in people's lives and they don't have structures that are agapic and they don't have relationships that are that are life-giving and love-sharing. Oh, I'm wearing the same shirt I wore when I made that video. See, the brain is so noisy. I know, I know, meditation, blah, blah, blah. They'll go opioid with other white people whose dreams have never been fulfilled. Not only white people, lots of people go opioid because soothes the chaos, closes in the world, shuts off the talking voices. Well, it's hard to do with, with mental energy and exertion and mental discipline. Uh, it's easy to do with a pill or a smoke or a drug. But it seems that the commitment to agape, to agape, to love, as the highest value, that's still out there pretty strong. Tom Holland has a point. And so I understand people in their exploration of a religion that isn't a religion. And, and Rafe, in response to a, a tweet that I made, put another way, despite the fact I'm convinced that the bones of the West derive from Christianity, I do not believe in the Christian myth. I wonder. Parts of it, yes. Parts of it, no. Not in the way I believe in the theory of evolution. That's an interesting statement. I think Jordan Peterson and John Verveke offer potential means past this. Worse, I don't think it's fully articulated. I don't remember which one came before the other, so... I don't think it fully articulates that the Enlightenment was or how it interrelates with religion. My hesitation in seeing the answer is simply a return to Christendom is so far I do not see how the claims of revelation can be made congruent with scientific materialism. I was going to do a, I should do a video just on revelation because if you're listening to modernist Christians talk about revelation, you're going to hear it in a certain way. Okay? And so it's helpful to think with ancient people and, and don't just hear what people say about Revelation. Watch what they do. Because I find that there's a lot of magical thinking when it comes to how people think they live. If you tell me to do something, I'll do it. If I decide to do something, I'll do it. Nah, that's not how people see. It's not how people think. It's not how people live. Read Romans 7. But then Christianity is a mess. And and I read this I read this thing that that went all over and I noticed Job did a little video and sent it to me. Since conservative and this this poor woman was complaining about the fact that others now there's ads pop into this one. Well, that's kind of interesting. Since conservative Christians keep coming at me here, I'm a Christian and I believe proselytizing is violence against another. Oh, violence got so, shlo so, so sloshy. I'm a Christian and I believe LGBTQ plus people are divine and should lead us. Well, that's interesting. I'm a Christian and I learn from people who do not share my faith. Well, I, I don't find that terribly unusual. I got to look at this bunion. Um, I'm a Christian and I don't go to church. Yeah. I'm a Christian and I don't believe the Bible is the word of God. I'm a Christian and I embrace sex positivity, which includes but does, isn't limited to sex outside of marriage. I'm a Christian and I believe everyone has access to God. Everyone in all caps. I'm a Christian and I do as I please, which is not to say I can harm anyone. That is never okay. See, but the, the problem with this line of thinking is that once, via, once the word violence gets real sloshy, well, 
You're complaining about all the harm done by to others, the people you're allied with, or to you based on not even what people are saying to you, but just what they're saying in general. That's violence. But here you imagine you can just post things on Twitter and not harm anyone? There's a definite lack of coherence. I'm a Christian. I know Christianity has been used as a weapon of white supremacy. For so long that any Christian who has an actively dismantling white supremacy is harming. So what in you needs to be dismantled and you're harming? And you don't even know it. I'm a Christian. I believe people know what's best for them. Except, of course, all those people who you labeled as white supremacists. They don't know what's best for them, according to you. Sometimes it means running away from Christianity. I applaud them. After the amount of abuse I experienced inside of Christianity, notice again the agency of these things. Because of toxic people and toxic theology, well, they were harming you, that's what you say, but I thought people know what's best. It's having one or two, having a faith and reclaiming it however I wish. Okay. Or leaving faith altogether. There's no th there is no third option. I don't understand. There's no going back to evangelism, evangelicalism, however you define that. There's no embracing toxic theology. Again, the word toxic is this proxy for healthy. I understand it's fashionable. It has some utility, but it's pretty sloshy. To be accepted, there's no mental hoops to ignore oppression. To run towards atheism as fast as possible if the condition to being a theist is that I have to embrace any type of toxicity or abuse. If me saying I'm a Christian bothers you because I reframe concepts, you were told, are written in stone, that's something you have to wrestle with. In other words, I get to be me tough on you, but you better be very careful being you because you'll hurt me. And it's like, oh, good grief. This pattern of human interaction, even just a good therapist should cure you of this, Christianity or not Christianity, because all you're covered with are buttons and you're pushing them out there in the world and you're posting it on Twitter. Twitter is just one button after another. If any identity I hold makes you uncomfortable, that's on you. Well, there's a degree of truth to that, quite a bit of truth to that. That's really not something I have to fix. That's true to that, but that goes the other way too. I have no responsibility to make you comfortable in my own space. You put it on Twitter, you're kind of in a communal space. And you don't like people saying other things that you imagine make other people uncomfortable. More so, it's a victim of religious abuse. I will not subject my... Oh, now, I'm a, now she's a victim. Should have said she's a survivor. That's the proper language. I'm a survivor of religious abuse. Because victim is so victimish survivor has victim plus strength i will not subject myself to re-traumatization experiences better get off of twitter or theologies to appease your discomfort okay you're not going to find those on twitter you may leave you may lie about me you may go on tirades about me as the devil i don't think she's the devil you may ignore me well stay off twitter and no one will even know about you. You may not demand a thing of me. I really don't. You may not hurt me. I will not allow it. I'm not sure if that one works either. Because it sure sounds like you've been hurt. And is that all your fault now? This is my space. This is my truth. And this is how I teach others and their treat others and their spaces. Yeah, you've definitely taught me something about how you treat others. And again, I've got no animosity towards this woman. I don't even know who she is. And apparently a bigger tweeter violating a Twitter etiquette reposted her tweets, didn't like them, called them Marxist. He's got a big Twitter following. She has a small one. And she asked, and I thought this was quite a good question. Would you be happier if I simply left Christianity? Well, he probably would, but, you know, you're quite right. That's not his to decide. You want to identify as a Christian? And 
define that in your own way. We all do that to one degree or another, but the utility of these labels breaks down when, in many ways, language is a is property of the commons, and if we if we don't if we don't use it well together, its utility breaks down, and when human beings don't have the good utility of language between each other, really bad things can happen. So, you know, I I appreciate her text. I'm glad she posted it. I'm glad it got picked up. Someone sent it to me. And I've seen other people reading it. It's, it's a contribution to the conversation. And if she would like to come on my channel, I'd love to have her on my channel. And I will... I will be as gentle with her as I am with um, atheists and um, people of just about every stripe out there. I'll be just as gentle with her as I was with Vouch. So who's a, a form of celebrity atheist and a um, sexual anarchist of some sort. So what isn't Christian in a sense, Tom, Collin, Tom Holland asks. Jordan Peterson says, don't pay attention to these self-stuck labels. They're of limited utility. They're of some utility. It's helpful in relating to, okay, you identify as a Christian. That helps me. That at least gives me a little bit of a platform. Maybe the Bible isn't the word of God. Okay, but you probably like Jesus. So we can talk about Jesus, and we can talk about what Jesus did, and we can look at the little bit of data, and now maybe you've shaped the data in a particular way so you get the outcomes you desire. That may be, but, you know, we work on that can't agree on what the labels mean. That's a real problem. We need an understanding of language that isn't as sloshy as what we're working with now. We wield words at 50% accuracy, and that's a real problem. And we all do it. None of us can none of us can know the words perfectly. And again, one of Jordan Peterson's little rules, it's very valuable, you know, try to use language with precision. Speak accurately. It's a it's a growing edge for all of us. Carl sent me this video, which was very interesting, by Brian Holdsworth. And Brian went from evangelical to Roman Catholic. And first he started talking about, in this video, about Protestants and reason and Aquinas. And I found that quite interesting. And I thought he made some good points. And then he talked about relevance. And I thought, well, part of what we have to do is part of this part of this very messy reality that is Christianity now has everything to do with talking to one another and trying things out and searching things out. And Christianity can have a lot of fads because it's very big, but fads are fads and are proven. And sometimes we find things that are helpful, at least helpful maybe for a decade or a few centuries, Maybe a few centuries later, they'll will be will recognize that they're a heresy. And in my reading of Alistair McGrath's book Heresy, that this is a this is a dead end that Christianity ought not take because it unravels it. But what we're doing now is is what Christians have always done, and so we should be talking to the Muslims and the Jews and the various groups within Christianity and the various spin-offs like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and the religion that isn't a religion, we should be talking to them. We can learn from them. If we watch language ca carefully, we'll probably be able to, I feel, and this might surprise some of you, and it's just as much a personal testimony as the woman whose tweet storm I just read. I feel I have grown in faith since doing this YouTube enterprise. I feel that interacting with, with others have, have made me more certain of Christ and his benefits towards me of the resurrected, as a, of the resurrected Lord than I was before. You live within a story, and that story you believe. Hilarious tweet by Tom Holland, this little historian's 
it's a meme and so some of you are listening to this there's a woman and she's holding up a kid and bouncing this cherished little girl in a pool uh, and the pool's labeled world war ii historians love world war ii and there's the first world war just 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 sinking and going under and then <laughs> and then tom holland of course tom holland's brother is another historian about the second world war which makes the tweet so funny and they're at the bottom of the pool byzantine um sassanian war of 602 to 628 so of course i looked that up on on wikipedia because i didn't know much about it apart from reading dominion and reading tom holland's book about islam and holland says in his tweet so true so unfair it's just a delicious delicious tweet but then you go to the historiography page and again you bump into what ancient historians deal with is that well why didn't those persians keep records like the greeks Oh, that shapes, that changes, that, that, that shapes the history we live in. Can science tell us the truth about the ancient war? Science is closing one eye and, and limiting the variables and, and dissecting it down. Who cares about it? Who cares about that war? Well, we had grandpas that fought in World War I and World War II, and it seems so close and so relevant, so... The relevance conversation makes a point too. Whoops, wrong button. So what do I do? I've lived an enormously blessed life. A privilege too. I don't find those two words are terribly interchangeable. I don't think that's a good way to go. I have the blessings of age. I've got 50 some years behind me. And they've been good years. Some years hard, but they've been good years. My cake is mostly baked. I'm not as plastic as I was before 25. Blessings of cultivated trust. Part of the benefit of being a Christian for a long time is having it deep in me, beneath my conscious self. And, and I, I notice some Christians who've deconstructed, and well, there's a lot of Christianity left in them too, just as Tom Holland notes there's a lot of Christianity left in the culture. I've had, I've, and trust is a tremendous help in times of uncertainty. And that's why people become more religious when things become unglued. No atheists in foxholes. Not always true, but the statement, the statement came about for a reason. We look for someone to call on. We look for someone to trust in when we realize we're in over our heads. The blessings of community have been richly blessed by surrounded, being surrounded by loving people who have my welfare and my well-being at heart, not just my nuclear family, but my church family. I look at people and they don't go to church and I think, yeah, I understand church is complicated, but if you can find a good church and a right church and a solid community, it's a tremendous blessing. People who will come alongside you, will help you out, will listen to you, will help you out if you need a loan, will, you know, if you have church deacons, will, you know, will, will do all kinds of things for you. Well-established, available, blessings of meaning. I can resist finding meaning and ideology and, 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 and performative things out there in the public square to be seen by people and, and rest in a broader religious narrative that says, you know, chances are good. By the time I get to the grave, Jesus will not have returned and the world will still be a mess, if not worse than today. And many of the things that I have participated in and the people I've invested in by that point, we'll be dead. But I can say that I have not labored in vain because I believe that there is a God who honors the imperfect gifts that I give. And in a life to come, we'll make good on those investments. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven, Jesus says, where moth and rust don't consume, where the age of decay doesn't eat it away. So I've been, I've been richly blessed Here's a tweet that, that I wrote. I found Brett Weinstein's appearance on Joe Rogan quite interesting. In an alignment, um, I talk about politics a little bit, which I shouldn't do. I share some of the disappointments over the performance of the Democrats and the Obama administration. For me, that data point undermines his big fits, which involves 
different getting different presidents elected i told people i told you early on in my video career i'm a political skeptic but a religious believer certainly potus is an important thing but presidents come and presidents go the world is awfully big and the united states government is awfully big i thought david fuller's video on the idw and jordan peterson was very helpful I think he's right in believing that the way forward is not simply a return to modernism and science, which Brett Weinstein and others like to wave like a flag. Science is a powerful tool, but its power is in isolating variables and finding one key relevant factor that changes the game. The challenges we face involve massive multivariable systems, systems which develop agencies, agencies that are superhuman, their principalities. What I hear from conceptual James and others is that classical liberalism, but again, there simply isn't any going back. Just Rafe and John Verveke have a point. There's not going back to past forms of Christianity as such. Even the orthodoxy practiced in America is not the orthodoxy practiced in Russia or Greece or Antioch. Things change. We change. We can't segment our lives. Now, modulating that variable to be highly traditional in a certain way i think that's very reasonable but nothing stays the same while there's sort of a well there's always a sort of going back and reclaiming a lost aspect the new comprehensive way forward also has new learnings and so this conversation between rafe and john verveke was productive i thought I can see a growing appreciation for the integral aspect. And hear me carefully here. Um, you know, spiral is a clever way of integrating circular and progressive. And yeah, the any conversations that can't somehow, um, any conversation that can't somehow recognize how it is the religious layer of the human stack that is the layer at which multiple variables are integrated isn't understanding why iconoclasm is back. You're not paying attention if you don't recognize that the conversation moving forward will be a theo will be theological in nature even if modernists can't recognize religion untagged from modernist conception of supernatural. Postmodernists have their own issues with narratives as I said. These people having their holy moment, they're going to want it again. They're going to want another hit from religion. I would recommend a fresh reading of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' Plan A. Many of these virtual and, and in real life conversation partners dismiss efforts with Christian DNA because they say, number one, it's been tried and failed. It's always failing. I'm a failure. Two, there's no time. I recommend Tom Holland's book, Dominion. I do it all the time. To recognize that our present moral structure is between competing elements within the Christian DNA often. And there's no time. We are surrounded by populations and institutions formed by this, by this religious DNA. I suggest that there's no time to remake the wheel. Figure out how to use the resources at hand. That's my two cents.